Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, it's a scorcher from sea to shining sea this morning. More than 100 million Americans are waking up to yet another day of sizzling triple-digit temperatures as excessive heat warnings stretch from New York City to Seattle. Our own Bill Karens with how bad it will get and when this heat wave could break. Third shots the charm, important new reporting on the COVID front this morning as the FDA prepares to approve a booster shot, potentially today for both Pfizer's and Moderna's vaccines. We'll tell you who's eligible for this third dose. Plus the CDC's new vaccine guidance for pregnant women as Delta surges. Setting the stage, New York's soon to be new governor in her first public remarks since Andrew Cuomo's shocking resignation distancing herself from his administration. No one will ever describe my administration as a toxic work environment. Her message to voters as she prepares to take office in less than two weeks. And who we are today, we're expecting to learn a little bit more about what exactly makes America, well, America, as the first racial breakdowns from the 2020 census are reported, will run through the data revealing a country more diverse than ever before. And good morning to you on this Friday Eve. Oh, yes. Almost there. Almost I know. There. I had forgotten too Friday until someone Eve said it before. Morning. Yeah, exactly. I know. We got a long way to go through the day. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there, though. We start this morning with the blistering heat wave sweeping the country. There are alerts in 34 states with 100 degree plus temperatures baking tens of millions of Americans from coast to coast. The heat in the West is continuing to fuel more than 100 large wildfires across the region. The Dixie Fire, one of the largest in recorded California history, has now grown to more than a half million acres. The fire is displacing entire towns in Northern California and people are returning to torched homes and scorched earth. Fortunately, no deaths have been reported, though three firefighters have been hurt. In all, nearly 900 buildings have been destroyed, according to Cal Fire. We have coverage from coast to coast this morning. NBC News correspondent Jake Ward is in Seattle, and NBC News meteorologist Bill Cairns is here in the east. Let's start with Jake. You know, heat waves like this used to be few and far between, especially in the Pacific Northwest, where many don't have air conditioning because the temps are usually so moderate. How is this latest heat wave impacting the region? What can people there expect today, Jake? Well, good morning, Joe. Good morning, Savannah. You know, it is true. You know, this is not a place known for heat. The kind of temperature that I'm feeling right now around 66 degrees is the kind of, you know, day you might see at the very peak of a summer Thursday. But we are going to instead, of course, see extraordinary temperatures both today and tomorrow, which is what has people in Seattle so worried. We're looking at temperatures from the mid 90s, maybe all the way up into the triple digits across the Pacific Northwest. And that feels like, a, you know, the normal thing if you're talking about a place like Florida. But here, in Seattle, you know, known for rain jackets, for cozying up inside. It is a real problem. People do not have the facilities that they require to cool off. They may need not even have access to something like ice in order to get through it. And so it has this region preparing for the worst. And Jake, they've already kind of used to it. This isn't the first heat wave to bake the Pacific Northwest this summer. In June, at least 96 people died in record-setting temperatures. And people learn lessons. How are they preparing this time around? You know, it's extraordinary to go across the city and see people still reeling from those three days in June in which triple digit temperatures broke all records. To see the, the temperatures coming back again in one summer is very scary for people. We spoke to the owners of ice cream parlors, the owners of pizza restaurants, the owner of a bar, all of whom are actually going to shut their doors. And you can imagine, you know, after COVID, where they had to build outside seating and now can't use it because it'll be too hot, you look at the temperatures in the front of a restaurant where you and I might sit, you then add another 20 degrees to the back of the restaurant. They say it is simply unsafe to be inside because, again, these structures are not built for these kinds of temperatures, Joe. Yeah, and speaking of structures, I mean, this heat wave isn't only impacting people. It affects animals and also infrastructure. In June, it literally melted parts of the Portland trolley system. So tell us, what could this heat mean for the power grid and other infrastructure there this time around? 
you know, it really, again, was not built for. This is the great trouble of climate change. We're not built for a future like this, so we can't take our cues from the past. That's what climate scientists are telling us. The mayor's office here says that they are doing whatever they can to get ready. They learned some lessons from June and are going to be looking out for possible disruptions to the power grid, to the transit system, and they are trying to open cooling stations for people to get that rare bit of air conditioning that is normally so hard to come by because you simply haven't needed it in the past here in the Pacific Northwest, Joe. All right, Jake Ward reporting from Cary Park there in Seattle. Jake, thanks. As we mentioned, the extreme heat out west is complicating the fight against California's Dixie Fire. The intense flames have forced firefighters to retreat and structures have been destroyed. Here's NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson with more. Joe, Savannah, good morning. There's something like 26,000 firefighters battling about 100 fires all across the West. Here in Northern California at the Dixie Fire, it's now so large that firefighters are split between two different fronts and it's only getting bigger and more dangerous. The colossal Dixie Fire setting a grim milestone. The nation's largest fire has torched more than 500,000 acres. It's massive spread, now more than half the size of Rhode Island, sending clouds of pollutants across the country. That plume now creates its own weather, meaning the winds can go any direction. The fire decimating small town Greenville, destroying nearly every man-made structure in sight, haunting new satellite images, showing the scope of the devastation, historic homes and businesses that stood for generations leveled, whole neighborhoods wiped off the map. This is authorities say a man was bent on causing more pain. 47-year-old college professor Gary Maynard was arrested and charged for serial arson across Northern California, accused of starting the nearby ranch fire. Court filings allege Maynard was in the midst of an arson setting spree and that he even tried to trap first responders fighting the Dixie Fire by gaining access to an evacuation zone and lighting fires behind them. And we should say that as the fire continues to grow, so does containment. Firefighters managing to get about 30 percent containment on this fire now. But again, the winds are expected to come back. The temperature is expected to rise into the triple digits, all making it more dangerous to be on the front lines. Guys, back to you. All right, thank you, Steve. Let's get more on those conditions out west and really the extreme temperatures across much of the nation. Good morning, News Now Weather. Hey, Bill, good morning. Hey, good morning. Isn't it crazy that they've been, you know, that many thousands of firefighters mm. and the Dixie Fire is still only 30% contained. As that just shows you how rugged the territory is, how brittle uh, all the fuel is, and how rapidly this fire has been spreading. So we already know it's the second largest fire in California history. It's the 15th most destructive fire. That's determined by how many structures it's burned. And we always talk about how many acres. A lot of people can't picture acres. So here's a better picture for you. It's been burning at a speed of 45 football fields per minute. So just picture a fire spreading at that rate. That's pretty incredible. So as far as the smoke forecast goes, we're getting a little bit of improvement in Colorado. Finally, it's been almost like a month straight of poor air quality. So that's a little bit of good news. Most of the smoke is going to be confined to the Pacific Northwest today. And it is going to be hot. Only, you know, not only is the air quality horrendous because of the smoke, but these temperatures are about 20 degrees warmer than they should be today. Portland, 102. Uh, Medford, 105. So today is really warm. Then we're slow. Slowly going to cool things kind of back where they should be on Saturday, 92 in Portland, Sunday, 87. So that's a little bit of improvement. Still pretty warm, though, Salt Lake City through Boise as we go throughout the upcoming weekend. And as far as the east goes, the heat is on today in many areas in the northeast. This should be the hottest day of the summer. We have 106 million people under heat advisories or warnings across the country. And those warnings do expand from Kansas City to St. Louis. And as far as the tropics go, Fred fell apart overnight over the top of the mountainous terrain of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. We thought that would happen. We still have to wait and see if it does get its act together. The Hurricane Center is going to continue to track it. Right now, it doesn't look much of anything, but they still think it has at least a chance to regenerate and get a little bit stronger as we go into Saturday morning when it's near the Key West and then somewhere near the Florida West Coast during Saturday night. And then it would be Sunday that it would be approaching the panhandle of Florida. Notice that the Hurricane Center does have it making landfall. We winds approximately 60 miles per hour. So that's a healthy tropical storm. Rainfall would be the biggest issues if that does happen. But there's still a lot of questions on if Fred actually does ever get its act back together. So for today, Washington, D.C., 99 degrees is your forecast high. And that is your record for the day today, too. Not far behind New York and Boston, a pair of 95s. And I think when I get to this point of year, guys, and I don't like to make too many promises, but I got a feeling this could be 
the last really, really, you know, the hottest summer day we're going to see until maybe next year. All right. Mm. That's good All to right. hear. Yeah. Hey, some relief maybe. All right, Bill. Yeah. Thanks so much. See you next hour. The FDA is expected to make a big announcement amending the emergency use authorization for both the Pfizer and Moderna COVID vaccines to allow immunocompromised people to get that third dose. That's according to two sources familiar with the plans. NBC News medical reporter Erica Edwards joins us now to discuss this reporting that I know you had exclusively just yesterday. Erica, good morning. So this is big news. Tell us about the science behind this decision. I know that's what they were waiting for, for the science to show that it does make sense. And also when the FDA is is expected to authorize use for this third dose. Hey, Savannah, good morning. So the FDA could make that change, could amend that emergency use authorization as soon as today. Now, to be very clear, this this extra dose would be for a specific group of people, relatively small group of people, um, with weakened immune systems. We're talking about those who have received organ transplants, people undergoing certain cancer treatments, those with HIV. Now, studies so far have indicated that this group either develops very few or no antibodies after two shots of either the, um, the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccines, but indeed a third dose seems to get them over that hump so that their bodies can start building that immune response that the rest of us have been, have been building all along, Savannah. And now, Erica, now, what's this process going to look like? How would eligible people get access to it? So after the FDA makes any official change to the regulation, the CDC needs to come in and officially recommend a third dose for this particular group of people. Now, the CDC um, advisory panel is scheduled to meet tomorrow to discuss this matter. Um, if all the pieces sort of fall into place and they vote to recommend this third dose, uh, patients could get that extra dose from their doctors as soon as this weekend. Savannah. And Erica, now this authorization is coming after the World Health Organization asked for a moratorium actually on third doses. And that's because so many people around the world have yet to receive even one shot. Now, of course, here in the U.S., a lot of that is due to the fact that interest in getting the shot is waning. But in other countries, it's because the supply isn't there. What are health officials saying about this move by the FDA? Yeah, so the World Health Organization did clarify that it doesn't necessarily oppose a third dose for the immune compromised, those who never had a good um, immune response in the first place. The WHO was really referring to those otherwise healthy people for whom there is no evidence yet that a third or extra dose is needed. Now, doctors mm -hmm. who treat um, immune compromised people are really hailing the expected decision today. Um, they have been unable to give that third dose. Um, until, the, until the FDA makes that amendment, they were unable to give that third dose to their patients who they say really need it to be fully protected against COVID-19. Savannah. All right, Erica Edwards, really good information there. Thank you so much. Well, it looks like the FDA will be pushing forward with that booster dose for some Americans. The CDC is now urging all pregnant women to get the shot. The latest CDC data shows that only 23% of expectant mothers have received at least one dose of the vaccine. Let's bring in Dr. Uche Blackstock. She's an NBC News medical contributor and the CEO of Advancing Health Equity. Dr. Blackstock, good morning. It's always great to have you now. The guidance on this was the opposite for a period of time. Hold off if you're pregnant until we know more. And so I know personally, and I'm sure you both do, a lot of pregnant and breastfeeding women who are scared to get the shot because of confusion over what it might mean for their baby. But now the CDC is citing an increased risk of complications for pregnant women who tested positive for COVID. So tell us about some of those risks and the evidence that pregnant women would want to hear that pointed right. to say that this is safe. So good morning, Savannah. Thanks so much for having me. So actually, there has been data since even earlier in the pandemic that pregnant people who are infected with coronavirus actually have a higher risk of severe disease, uh, being placed on a ventilator, and even placed in the intensive care unit. They also have a higher risk of de delivering uh, their pregnancy earlier, so preterm uh, labor. And so obviously that's very, very concerning. And we've had sort of a, a lukewarm recommendation from the CDC regarding the vaccine. I think with the Delta variant, it became very clear that the CDC had to come out and fully recommend this vaccine, especially with the low vaccination rates among mm -hmm. pregnant people. It was incredibly imperative. I'm glad that they made this decision. I do think that it was long overdue. And I think that the data shows so far that the vaccine does not have any untoward effects towards mm. uh, the pregnant person or um, the growing uh, fetus and baby. Mm. 
So, Doctor, we're already seeing an increase in COVID cases tied to students who are heading back to school. Now, California is requiring all teachers and school staff get vaccinated or get tested weekly. How big of a difference will that make in the fight against outbreaks in schools? So this was the right decision. I hope every state follows suit. In order to decrease the spread of virus within schools, it has to be a multi-layered strategy. Part of that strategy is masking. Another part is physical distancing and testing. But the other part is vaccination. Um, and everyone who is eligible for a vaccination in schools, whether it's staff and teachers or children over 12 years old, should be vaccinated. Schools are congregate settings. They have the potential to be high risk areas if mitigation measures are not followed. A vaccination is just another layer of protection. And Dr. Blackstock, Texas Governor Greg Abbott announced that the state is sending 2,500 medical personnel to overwhelmed hospitals across the state. We've been seeing the fact that hospitals are overwhelmed, nurses, doctors facing burnout. Though the governor there is still holding firm against a mask mandate. Do you think this additional staff helps? I mean, tell us what this does for healthcare workers who are battling burnout. Right. Well, first of all, what would help is a, a mask mandate in Texas. That would help, um, obviously. Um, and, and it's unfortunate and preventable that these medical professionals are, are being recruited and having to go there because what we're seeing is that hospitals are at capacity. When hospitals are at capacity, not only COVID patients don't receive the proper care, but also patients who present with non-COVID um, complaints and problems as well. And these are also states that have uh, low staffing rates. So it's just sort of the perfect storm um, for this sort of situation not to work out. Um, yes, these medical professionals are needed, but this is preventable. And I hope that uh, Texas officials reconsider uh, the mask mandates and other policies that will help protect Texans. Mm. All right. Dr. Blackstock, as always, thank you so much. Appreciate your thank expertise. You, thank you. And if you have questions about kids and COVID, News Now is taking an in-depth look at how the virus can impact kids and what parents need to know. Be sure to join Aaron Gilchrist and Morgan Radford for a special half hour now in focus, children in COVID. That is today at 1.30 on NBC News Now. Turning now to New York and the major changes underway since Governor Andrew Cuomo's announcement that he'll resign. Incoming Governor Kathy Hochul promised change in a news conference yesterday, saying there will be turnover in her administration while referencing the attorney general report on Governor Cuomo's alleged sexual harassment. No one has named, who is named as anything, doing anything unethical in the report will remain in my administration. She will soon hit the ground running as there are just 13 days left in Governor Cuomo's tenure at the top of New York politics. He has not been charged with any crimes related to that attorney general report, and he disputes many of the allegations. MSNBC anchor Yasmin Basugian joins us now from the state capitol in Albany, New York. Yasmin, good morning. So what kind of change is the lieutenant governor proposing? Is she going to be cleaning house altogether? Yeah, I mean, you heard it there uh, herself. It seems like that's exactly what she's going to be doing. She's going to be cleaning house. I mean, I'll mention it again because it was a really poignant moment, I think, during her her press conference yesterday in which she did say she didn't say unlawful. Actually, she went so far as to say unethical behavior uh, mentioned in that 165 page report released by the attorney general. Anybody deemed to have unethical behavior will not be serving uh, in her administration. She has been making phone calls across the state, not only with local legislators, uh, but also senators as well, Schumer and Gillibrand as well. I know uh, the president had tried to reach out to her yesterday while she was on a plane. She wasn't able to speak to him at that point, but I know she's going to be speaking to him. So I think over the next two weeks, she's going to really be building uh, this administration. At one point yesterday, Savannah, she was actually asked during the press conference as to how she's going to reestablish trust uh, after the Cuomo administration, seeing that she is a part of the Cuomo administration. She's been the lieutenant governor uh, for Andrew Cuomo for the last uh, seven years or so before that, she served uh, as a member of Congress for the 26th Congressional District. And she said, listen, um, we accomplished a lot during the Cuomo administration. She touted a lot of the Cuomo policies and accomplishments um, throughout his um, term. However, she feels as if she's going to be able to dis distinguish herself. And though she was asked about some of her legislative priorities going forward, she did kind of skirt around that issue and say Governor Cuomo is still the governor of the state for the next 13 days. But she certainly is going to be priorities prioritizing, obviously, um, tackling the Delta variant mm. and getting as many New Yorkers vaccinated as possible.
Now, Yasmin, I love the detail that she missed the president's call, which is understandable if you are on a flight. And actually, it's because she's been traveling the state while this scandal's going on at the Capitol. So talk us through how she's, I suppose, both physically but also in her speech yesterday, distanced herself from Governor Cuomo. Yeah, it's funny um, that you mentioned that, Savannah, because when I heard that in the press conference live, I thought, who misses the yeah, president's exactly. call? But of course, she was on a plane. She was traveling. So she will be getting back to him. If that was me, I'd say, get me through as, as soon as possible. Uh, nonetheless, um, she talked a, a little bit about her relationship with the governor. And there had been some reporting leading up to yesterday's press conference that she did not necessarily have a close relationship. And she definitely kind of showed the fact that she was and is a hometown girl, right? She's from Buffalo. Her alma mater is in Syracuse. She called on those two reporters first in the press conference uh, yesterday. And she's been spending a lot of time in, in both of those uh, regions uh, throughout her uh, tenure as uh, lieutenant governor. Uh, nonetheless, she talked about her relationship uh, with the governor. Let's take a listen to what she had to say about that. I think it's very clear that the governor and I have not been close, um, physically or otherwise, in terms of uh, much time. And so I've been traveling the state and do not spend much time uh, in his presence or in the presence of many in the state capitol. But that is what has been re being reported. She definitely came out strong yesterday. Um, it's certain that she wants to distinguish herself from the Cuomo administration. She has promised she's going to announce her lieutenant governor uh, before she is sworn in as governor in just, I guess, 12 days time now. Um, and so we're going to be looking out for that announcement as well as things unfold over the next two weeks or so. And Yasmin, she actually expressed a little bit of frustration with those 12 days, kind of making it seem like she wanted to just get into it now. But of course, that's not the plan. So tell she us did. what that transfer of power in Albany is going to look like. She was quite frank about it, actually. She said, it's not what I asked for. I didn't ask for these 14 mm -hmm. days. But nonetheless, the Cuomo administration has said it was best for a seamless and simple uh, transition. Um, and I was um, kind of surprised that she was so frank about that moment. I will say the two days that we got to look out for when it comes to the Cuomo administration um, and the impeachment investigation that is ongoing here in Albany, um, in the Capitol behind me, is Friday when the governor will be submitting his um, counter information um, that the assembly has asked for in order to wrap up their their impeachment investigation. So we're going to be looking out for that. And then on Monday, the judiciary will also be meeting to comb over hundreds of thousands of pages of documents as they are, as they are wrapping up. Uh, the impeachment investigation. And then the question is whether or not they're going to be drawing up those articles of impeachment if a vote will be uh, mm -hmm. come on those articles of impeachment. And if, in fact, um, the vote is in favor of impeachment, then, of course, it'll go to trial uh, in the Senate. So there's that, right, the impeachment line that we're following. But then uh, the transition over the next uh, 12 days or so as the lieutenant governor is building her administration and preparing um, to enter office as the first making history, first female governor of New York State. All right, Yasmin, thank you so much for your reporting from Albany for us today. Coming up, trouble in the House as moderate and progressive Democrats spar over infrastructure. Yeah, the emerging arguments on the Hill that could tank the budget approval process. That's up next. A lot of questions remain this morning about the future of any kind of infrastructure bill getting passed in Congress. Before leaving for recess, Senate Democrats passed the framework for a $3.5 trillion budget plan. That's the so-called human infrastructure plan. But that was just the first step in a messy political process that could allow for the vast expansion of the social safety net without any Republican support. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Leanne Caldwell joins us now with more. Leanne, good morning. So Democrats, as we know, both hold both houses of Congress by slim margins, especially in the Senate. So passing this depends on unity. The price tag now alarming some important moderates. So does that put this plan in danger? Good morning, Joe. It might not be in danger at this point, but it definitely makes things difficult for Leader Pelosi, Speaker Pelosi and Leader Schumer. Yesterday, just a couple hours after they passed this for this framework of this $3.5 trillion plan, Senator Joe Manchin threw a bombshell into the process, releasing a statement that he has concerns with the price tag, saying, given the current state of the economic recovery, it is simply irresponsible to continue spending at levels more suited to respond to a Great Depression or a Great Recession, not an economy that is on the verge of overheating. Now, that is a 
similar message that Senator Kirsten Cinema has said in the past. She also is concerned with a $3.5 trillion price tag. And it's not just uh, relegated to the Senate. Also, some moderate members of the House have same concerns. And like you said, Joe, they need every single Democratic vote to pass this. So let's talk about what's next. The resolution now heads to the House, which is returning from recess early to work on it. Walk us through the process from that point to, to try and get to the end. Yeah, I just want to make clear that this framework that the Senate passed is not actual legislation. It is just that a framework. And now the committees are getting to work to actually write the legislation. But the House also has to pass that framework. And once they are done with it, then they will have to vote on the actual legislation. Again, this process could take weeks, if not months. Senator Schumer has given the committees a September 15th deadline to finish their work. So we still have quite a ways to go. And as you mentioned, not a finished, finished piece of legislation yet, but it does give us some insight into Democratic priorities and perhaps sort of the differences in priorities within the party. But yeah. what all does it address? It sure does give us uh, insight into their priorities because they do outline the categories of where they want this spending. It is a major transformation, really, of the economy. It's free preschool, free universal community college, an expansion of health care, including uh, Medicare, uh, paid family and medical leave, a lot of climate change proposals. There's some a lot of elder and senior and disabled uh, care in there as well. So these, this is the big Biden administration plan that he campaigned on. This is something that Democrats have been wanting to do for decades, and they're going to try to do it in this one piece of legislation, Joe. We'll see what happens, and we know you'll stay on it. Leon Caldwell, as always, thank you so much. Now to the deadly conflict in Afghanistan, where the country's army chief has been replaced as the Taliban makes rapid advances. Some estimates say the militant group now controls almost two-thirds of the country. Thousands are fleeing to the capital city of Kabul for safety, and Kelly Kobayea is there with this report. Savannah and Joe, the State Department said those peace talks in Doha, Qatar, are painfully slow. And they also said the violence in this country is cause for grave concern. The Taliban claims hundreds of prisoners in Afghanistan's second largest city, Kandahar, are free after they say they overwhelmed the jail holding the insurgents and flung open the gates. This after a devastating setback in the north for Afghan officials. Hundreds of Afghan soldiers under siege of the Kunduz airport reportedly surrendered. Taliban video purports to show vehicles, weapons, even an attack helicopter now in their hands. By some estimates, the Taliban now controls 65 percent of Afghanistan. More families are fleeing to the capital, Kabul, every day. This woman says the Taliban are not allowing girls and women to go to the market. Under the Taliban, girls were banned from school and women from work. Many here are terrified those dark days are about to return. Do you worry about the girls' safety today? Yes, the principal says. They tell us you all might die. It upsets you. Yes, she says. I tried to help the women. I'm very sad. When I see all these girls, I get really upset now. A student at the American University here told me that her mother bought her a burqa, not to cover up, but she said because they have to be prepared. Savannah, Joe. Let's take a look at what else is making news around the world this morning. Raf Sanchez joins us now from Tel Aviv. Hey, Raf. Savannah Joe, good morning. Italy has just recorded what may be Europe's hottest ever temperature. The island of Sicily saw 120 degree temperatures yesterday. That figure still needs to be verified, but if confirmed, it's the latest marker of the brutal heat that is triggering wildfires and chaos across Europe. In Russia, a tourist helicopter has crashed into a volcanic lake in the country's far east. Nine survivors have been found, but another seven are missing, according to Russian media. The chopper went down in a remote area with heavy fog that is complicating rescue efforts. 
And finally, German Tinder just got a little hairier. An animal shelter in Germany has started posting profiles of cats and dogs available for adoption on the dating app. The logic that a lonely human looking for love might actually be looking for a pet. And guys, the shelter says the response so far has been insane, which is not a surprise. <laughs> I love that. It's a cute idea. It's a great idea. A dog. I would have caught anyone off guard, though. They're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> guess we're not going to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeding you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Raph. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Coming up, is this one more thing to worry about? An asteroid hurtling toward Earth. Yeah, but before you head to that backyard bunker, I don't have one. <laughs> there's no need to panic just yet. We'll explain next. Welcome back. So for this good talk, we've got some good news and some bad news from NASA about an asteroid that could hit Earth. The good news, scientists have a better handle on where asteroid Bennu is going to be for the next 200 years. The bad news, they have changed the chances of it clobbering our planet, as they now think that that's more likely. But before you get too worried, they say the odds are still really low, about 1 in 1,750 over the next couple of centuries. Scientists say rock samples from the asteroid collected from their OSIRIS-REx spacecraft have helped them better understand its path. So we are not sure how to feel about that one. All right, now to NBC's week-long series, Justice for All. Today, we're taking a closer look at a law that only two states recently passed, a ban on police lying to minors during interrogations. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster joins us now from Chicago, where he's been hearing from one man who says this law could have saved him. Shaq, good morning. What more can you tell us? Good morning, Savannah. Well, this is a law that activists have called landmark legislation, and it attacks the idea of false confessions given by minors during intense and deceptive interrogations. I want to introduce you to a man by the name of Terrell Swift, who advocated for this law in hopes that it prevents other minors, other boys, from going through what he went through. As the bill was signed, Terrell Swift was in tears considering what he'd lost. This bill, um, I, I truly believe, could have saved my life. Swift spent more than 15 years in prison, convicted of a rape and murder he didn't commit. Lied to by detectives and coerced into a confession during an interrogation without his attorney or his parents. I was taken advantage of and manipulated by the police. But me being a 17-year-old, I was led to believe that if I worked with them or cooperated, I would go home. Because they told you that? Because they told me that. SB 2122, Illinois becoming the first state to ban police from lying to or deceiving minors during interrogations. False confessions have played a role in far too many wrongful convictions. Until now, lying to suspects, including children, was legal in every state. Deception used as a common police tactic for decades. We know that once deception is employed, innocent people feel absolutely cornered and, um, and are going to confess. The Innocence Project reports one in four people clear through DNA evidence had given a false confession. Chicago is being the false confession capital of the world. State Senator Robert Peters introduced the bill. Should it be considered landmark legislation to say you can't lie to kids in interrogations? It is a landmark piece of legislation. It's also kind of sad and upsetting because we shouldn't have been in this place in the, you know, in the first place. Illinois led the nation in criminal exonerations for the past three years, according to the National Registry of Exonerations. 91 out of 101 false confessions in the state of Illinois were extracted from men of color. Um, so I think in many ways this was the time to talk about this issue, um, to bring it to the forefront and to really center it as an issue of racial justice. A reform requiring significant outside pressure, but passing nearly unanimously and with support from law enforcement groups. We're in an era of reform, and we understand that, and that's actually a good thing. How are you not angry at this whole situation? I have kids, wife, beautiful family. I owe it to myself and to them to continue to live. For Swift, it's healing through advocacy. 
both still in progress. I know it's, it's a big deal, a huge deal, and I helped in facilitating this, you know, everything getting passed. But I guess for me, I'll feel that gratification when all states have adopted it. Now, this law has already been, been enacted in the state of Oregon and has been introduced in states like New York and Washington. But there's also a public safety component to this. In both Terrell's case and also if you go back to the Central Park rape case, as these boys were being interrogated and imprisoned, the real killer was still out there and able to commit other crimes. The idea is, is that if you get more accurate confessions and more accurate investigations, it will lead to better public safety and better justice for all. Savannah? All right, Shaq, thank you so much. Really powerful report. Black Americans are more likely to die from COVID, but many say they are hesitant to get the vaccine. NBC News correspondent Megan Fitzgerald explains how mistrust stemming from the Tuskegee experiments is keeping some black people from getting inoculated. The nation racing to win over the unvaccinated as COVID cases surge. Are you vaccinated? Not at the moment. But among some African Americans, fear. What's the hesitancy? We've been told so many lives so many years. Mistrust in the medical system rooted in history, like the Tuskegee study in 1932, a 40-year experiment where nearly 400 black men living with syphilis were denied treatment, public health officials wanting to see the effect of the disease untreated. As a result, more than 100 men died from syphilis or related complications. Knowing that you were denied treatment and that you were lied to would affect anybody. Carmen Head Thornton's grandfather, Freddie Lee Tyson, was a part of the study. There's a lesson in taking broken pieces and turning it into something that's effective and supportive. Turning the pain of the past into purpose. Step in Carmen and several other descendants are speaking out in a new documentary encouraging people to get vaccinated. If you're using the syphilis study um, as your rationale for not getting the vaccine, to just stop doing that. Out of 195 million Americans who received at least one shot, only 10 percent are African-American. But black people are two times more likely to die from the disease. It was a shock. It's a reality that hits home for Cornelius Daniel. His aunt and uncle were too afraid to get vaccinated and died last month, hours apart from COVID-19. It's traumatizing, um, particularly when you know that there was a possible solution. Trauma fueling the race to change minds before it's too late. Megan Fitzgerald, NBC News, Washington. Our thanks to Megan for that report. Coming up, an America that's more diverse than it's ever been. That's what historic new data from the 2020 census is expected to show when it's released today. We will take a closer look up next. Today, new data from the 2020 census will be released, giving an updated portrait of a country that has grown more diverse than ever. For the first time, all population growth has been driven by minorities. William Fry, senior fellow at the Brookings Institute, joins us now to make sense of this all. Good morning, William. Thank you so much for being here. So though the official data will actually be released later, we do have some insight into what this is going to show, as I just mentioned. So tell us, what are the headlines here? Sure. I mean, I think people are going to be surprised about how much more diverse the United States is going to be. Uh, there's a very good possibility that we're going to have a small decline in our white population. In other words, you fill out the census, you decide what you're going to identify yourself as, what race you're going to be. And uh, this would be the first census that that happened. That, that would mean all the growth uh, in this country over the last 10 years would be coming from people of color. Probably Latinos will account for about half of that growth. Asian Americans maybe a quarter of that growth. And probably for the first time, we're going to have more than 40 percent of the U.S. population uh, will be people of color. So, you know, that'll spread out differently in different states and in different parts of the country. But it, but it really, we're becoming more diverse everywhere. And what this census will show is all the data from all the states and all the cities and all the counties. Uh, you'll be able to look that up and see how you how you fare and how your community fares over the last 10 years. 
And so, William, as you just mentioned, that we are expecting to see this decline in the number of white Americans. And that's actually the first time ever, and it's ahead of projections. Expand on that a little bit for us. Yes. I mean, I, you know, first of all, we need to think that the, the white population, and these are people who say they're white and don't identify with any other race or ethnic group. They're not mixed race people, but just, just that say they're white, which is it's still the largest part of the U.S. population. But it's older than the rest of the population, which means uh, it has a higher level of mortality. More people die. Fewer people are born because there are proportionally fewer women in their childbearing ages in this older population. And so over time, really for this last decade, the white population had more deaths than births. Now, there is immigration of whites. Uh, there are There is white immigration. But even that has come down a little bit over the last decade with immigration restrictions. And in the aftermath of the Great Recession in the first part of this decade, uh, the economy didn't attract as many more immigrants. So uh, even though we're going to continue to have a very slow growth or decline in our white population, it was, uh, you know, accentuated for these reasons. And I know you've spoken in the past about a cultural generation gap. Is that what you're talking about here, where older generations are whiter than younger ones? Yeah, I mean, one of the things we might find from these census results is that the people under age 18 in the U.S. may be minority white. That means whites may be half of the population, only less than half of the population under age 18, the young population, people of color. And so, you know, the cultural generation gap is we've seen it in politics. A lot of older people, people my age, <laughs> and it's a largely white generation, somehow have a little trouble grasping this change demographically. And it's got, it's got caught up in politics and attitudes about immigration and so forth. So uh, uh, the, the younger population, of course, is much more open to diversity. So that's the cultural generation gap in attitudes that we're seeing in this country. William, very interesting and so much that we will find out later today as this comes out. Thank you for joining us for a preview. Happy to do it. It is time now for our CNBC Money Minute, the biggest financial headlines of the day and why they matter to you. And Frank Holland is with us this morning. Hi, Frank. We haven't seen you in a little bit. Good to have you. Hey, good morning, Savannah. Always great to see you, too. Um, Wall Street is set for a bit of a mixed open this morning. In focus today, reports on unemployment and producer prices, plus earnings from Disney and Airbnb. Purdue Pharma's quest to settle thousands of lawsuits over OxyContin and, over o and other opioid painkillers and enters its final phase today. Nearly two years after filing for bankruptcy, the company will ask a judge to approve its plan to reorganize into a new entity that's no longer controlled by members of the Sackler family. Purdue says the plan could be worth $10 billion over time, with a portion of the money going to victims and their families. Opponents say the deal gives the Sacklers legal protection, even though they haven't personally filed for bankruptcy or admitted wrongdoing. The housing boom rolls on. Realtor.com's out with its annual list of the hottest zip codes in the U.S., released exclusively to USA Today. This year's top markets are giving buyers more bang for their buck in the burbs, including Rochester, New York, and Columbus, Ohio. A few factors are contributing to the popularity of these neighborhoods, a strong job market, a better price per square foot, and easier access to metro areas. So interesting. People want to get out of the city, but they still want to be able to get back to the city sometimes. Savannah, back over to you. Thank you so much, Frank. And coming up, mass incarceration is an epidemic all its own here in the States. But as part of NBC News' week-long series that we've been bringing you, Justice for All, we'll introduce you to folks looking to root out corruption in our complex justice system. That's up next. Wrongful convictions and technical violations, experts say those are two major reasons for over-incarceration in America. According to the Brennan Center for Justice, the U.S. accounts for less than 5 percent of the world's population, but has 25 percent of its prisoners. But there are people working to reform our justice system. NBC News Now correspondent Issa Gutierrez has more on the fight to end over-incarceration. The U.S., long known for its enforcement of law and order, incarcerates more people per capita than any other nation, with more than 2 million people behind bars. Roughly 630,000 of those people are in local jails, and 74% of them have not been convicted of a crime. Most are still locked up because they cannot afford bail. In recent years, there's been a bipartisan effort towards reform, but progress has been, for the most part, slow. 
We have been conducting criminal justice with a chainsaw instead of a scalpel. We have not been focusing on, on the 6% of criminals who commit 60% of the crime because we're so busy locking up everybody. Drug offenses are a contentious issue and often lie at the center of the debate, but the problems and solutions to mass incarceration are far more complicated. While nonviolent drug offenses account for more than half a million incarcerations, about four out of five prisoners are behind bars for other offenses. Instead, researchers point to the fact that community supervision, such as parole and probation, also often lead to reincarceration due to the restrictive burdens placed on those under watch. 45% of the state prison population is due to technical violations of probation or parole, like leaving the state to visit your child, which is what happened to rap artist Meek Mill. I thought the definition of probation was to help better you, keep you on track, and not destroy you. Those most affected, the poor and people of color. The number of black Americans who are locked up continues to highlight the disparity, representing 40% of the incarcerated population, but only 13% of U.S. residents. However, not everybody agrees that we are over-incarcerating. Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton tweeting that, quote, we have a major under-incarceration problem in America, and it's only getting worse. But the country also has a persistent problem with wrongful convictions. Studies estimate that between 1 and 6 percent of the prison population could be innocent. And while there have been significant efforts over the years to reform the system, there have only been about 2,800 recorded exonerations in the last 32 years. Attorney Patricia Cummings heads Philadelphia's Conviction Integrity Unit, which investigates potential wrongful convictions and tries to prevent them from occurring in the future. Immediate harm you see is to the individual who gets wrongfully incarcerated. What people don't see often is the harm that it does to the victim, to the community. The causes of wrongful convictions are deeply rooted and taint almost every aspect of the justice system. Eyewitness misidentification accounts for about 30% of those exonerated last year. False confessions were present in 26% of exonerations litigated by the Innocence Project, a legal nonprofit organization committed to exonerating and advocating for those wrongfully convicted. There is no doubt in my mind um, that false confessions occur. Forensic science is also commonly misapplied, making up 52% of Innocence Project's exonerations and 24% of all wrongful convictions nationally, according to the National Registry of Exonerations. Police and prosecutorial misconduct was found in the convictions of over half of the innocent people later exonerated. The creation of the Conviction Integrity Unit began as a hopeful remedy 20 years ago, but has since become a nationwide patchwork of just a few dozen disconnected units, with many having never exonerated anyone. But several new CIU offices have opened across the country within the last year. Some units have become standouts, like District Attorney Larry Krasner's office in Philadelphia, a city with a justice system historically rife with corruption that now may provide some solutions. Since 2018, 21 people have been exonerated, representing one out of every 10 exonerations during that time. What does a conviction rate mean if you're convicting innocent people? Is this a good time for the criminal justice system right now? Yes, there is a deep grassroots social movement for change and reform in criminal justice. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now.